We all know that there are major challenges that need to be solved, but we don't have a clear sense of how to get there or what it's going to look like. And so unless we're talking about that same future, we can't march forward and find a way towards that. My name is Grayson Armstrong, and I'm an ophthalmologist here in Boston, Massachusetts. My career is a little bit atypical. I started off in medical school without any background in health policy, technology, or the like. I was a music major early on. When I started to explore medicine, I got a master's in public health and started to explore international global health and realized there were major challenges in access to ophthalmology and access to the care that we can provide. I spent a little time abroad in the Middle East and found that there were patients there that couldn't access care after civil war in Syria, after trauma, or just for routine care, and felt like there had to be a better way, and started to try to find ways to use technology to advance the access to care for those patients. I started training at Massachusetts Eye and Ear for my ophthalmology residency. And at that hospital, we have an eye emergency room. And there's really only a few hospitals in the country that have an eye emergency room. And so patients will come from all over New England, but really from all over the world for a second, third, or a fourth opinion on their eye care. I felt like there had to be a better way, again, that these patients could get the care that they need before they come to see us in person. A future state of ophthalmology had to be a possibility, whether it's through technology or advanced models of care, through triage and better, better uh, practice models. So one thing led to another. I started to try to implement and create new technology with engineers over at MIT and then at Mass Eye itself and start to put those into practice in clinical trials. And here we are today trying to just find new ways to, to serve the, the patients that we have. There's a few major challenges to the providers and patients across the country and really globally right now. Number one is that there's more patients than there are physicians to care for them. And there aren't enough hours in a day for the current practicing ophthalmologists to, to care for the patients that need to see them. Patients are left out and again, that same access to care issue is arising. Beyond that, we're seeing a massive efflux of individuals from the healthcare profession, whether that's physicians or the technicians that help support the ophthalmologists. And we're really stuck in our old ways of thinking about healthcare. We don't have new models of care or new technology that can help advance the field beyond where we started practicing 20, 30 years ago. Sure, we might have new OCTs, we might have better fundus cameras, but do we have new vital ways of taking care of patients in the office? I'd say no, we're still stuck at the slit lamp with the indirect ophthalmoscope and with the OCTs that are just one-on-one -on -one patient interactions. And I, I really do believe there has to be a better way of getting beyond that. It has to be different, number one. And so how do I think it's going to be different? Well, I think there's going to be new and innovative technologies that can screen patients well before they ever reach an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor at all. I think that there's going to be home-based testing. There's going to be testing wearables that are just constantly monitoring where patients are with their care. And not only ophthalmic care, right? The eye is really the window to the rest of the body. It's the only part of the body where you have access to nerve tissue, vessels, and you can access things about people's brains, whether it's Alzheimer's or neurologic disease. You can access things about cardiovascular status, kidney disease. You can really get a sense of the whole person through the eye. And so we have the onus on us as a specialty to try to figure out a way to make that actionable. Once they get to us, I think that there are new novel ways of caring for the patient in the office, right? We can use AI to augment our diagnostics and find diseases faster, better, more efficiently, target better precision medicine therapies for patients when they're in the office with us. So we can educate them not only on the general disease, but the specific treatment that might solve the problem for them. And then if you need that patient to go through surgery, I think that we can task shift and find new ways for ophthalmologists to, to basically use their skills to the highest level of the profession while offloading or automating other aspects of the care um, to either machines or technologies or others in the healthcare team. Well, I think number one, we're all standing in our own way. And the problem really is that we don't have a clear vision right now of what that future looks like 20, 30 years out. Everyone's talking about it in different pockets. There's silos of people, whether it's an industry on the patient side and advocacy groups, whether it's on the ophthalmologist side at these big meetings, we all know that there are major challenges that need to be solved, but we don't have a clear sense of how to get there or what it's going to look like. And so unless we're talking about that same future, we can't march forward and find a way towards that. 
And so I would say the most important thing that came out of what we're talking about here is that we need to find new ways to reimagine the future, number one, together, figure out what that goalpost is going to look like, and then back up and try to find ways to tackle each and every challenge along the way, whether that's new and novel technology, whether that's regulatory, whether that's something as easy as just training physicians to be open-minded about new models of care, because it's really hard to change people's behaviors. They've been practicing this way for really hundreds of years. Patients need to be educated on new tools and technology. They need to understand the risks and benefits of putting their data into a new AI algorithm, for example. These things aren't obvious, and they need to be tackled very thoughtfully. And if we can start doing that now and start mapping that future now, then hopefully in 20, 30 years' time, we'll find a, uh, a realized vision. Most of the care that I provide is one-on-one -on -one in person, but I'm trying to find new ways to provide that care remotely through telemedicine. And so my expertise is trying to find new and novel ways of actually implementing the technology in the patient's home, in the patient's community, closer to where they live, get that data, and then get that into my office where I can review that data remotely, have a conversation with the patient, and provide them just as high quality care, if not better, than what I could have done in the office. And so I think that it was inspiring, and in some ways it kind of uh, validates my vision to come to a meeting like this and have everyone else talking about that same vision together. We were talking about how there is this need. People realize that, where I'm not just thinking in a silo. They understand that AI and machine learning is a new reality, and that this needs to be incorporated within the, the tools themselves, but also across the whole ecosystem of care. And it really just does show that within the hospital that I'm working at, I feel this onus now to, uh, to implement these models, to test them out and prove not only in an academic setting that this can be done, but that this can be done in a cost-effective way so that other practices will take this on, will implement these models of care and not feel burdened or stressed that this is going to be um, a loss of revenue so that companies can innovate in this space and say, okay, there are ophthalmologists doing this this is something that we actually need to start working on. Basically, I think that I feel after this conference a relief, a relief that other people are thinking this way, but a new inspired um, onus to try to actually implement it. Having other perspectives here was really helpful. There are people here that have been practicing ophthalmology for 20, 30, 40 years. And it's interesting, those same individuals had a similar vision than I do early on in my career. To have industry sitting there and listening and giving their perspectives in an open forum where we're all kind of talking about these new models together, I mean, it was very liberating. I think that for the first time, I realized that it's not really just the physicians trying to find better ways for patients to do this. The companies care about this just as much. Other ophthalmologists are caring about this just like I am across the country. And we can all really come together and find these solutions together. It did. So I, it was hard to know what the expectations were at the beginning because we were all coming in from different, you know, different backgrounds, different areas of the industry. And so it's hard to bring people together and have open dialogue because everyone has their own siloed opinion on what the future is going to look like. A lot of companies might not want to reveal the things they're working on. Ophthalmologists, having come from practice where they're busy treating their patients, are probably in the weeds trying to make um, their patient outcomes better one-on-one, -on -one, but then to liberate that mindset and say, okay, let's take a step back and reimagine what things will look like 20 years from now. Let's not worry about what you did yesterday. Let's not worry about what you guys are working on in your, your labs to, to, today. Let's think about what all of this might look like, not related to any specific company, not related to any specific physician, but what can this all look like for patients, for better outcomes, for patient satisfaction? So that, I think, was interesting. I feel that for the first time, people could basically take a step back, relieve themselves of any of the stresses that came with them, um, uncouple themselves from kind of their delegate status from their company or delegate status from their institution, um, and have an open dialogue of just what is the future going to look like. The, um, the interesting thing also is that it provided an opportunity to not only see that uh, future vision, but then to also go backwards and say, what is it that's holding us back from getting there? What are the risks and why haven't we done this already? Why isn't this already a reality today? Well, unconstrained thinking is basically washing away all of the things that we understand to be true 
and all the things that we understand so so uh, tangibly are impacting and limiting our ability to care for patients like we want to today. Basically, it's it's just being creative, right? It's thinking about problems in a new way. It's hard to do because if you're sitting there with the patient one-on-one -on -one every day, five days a week, you are doing prior authorizations. You're limited by the technology that's not able to integrate with other systems across a, you know, uh, the hospital, the clinic. You can't do anything more than fax the records over to your colleagues across the city. But if you sit back and think, okay, well, what is truly possible? Maybe there is a way to do this better. And so unconstrained thinking to me is just trying to find a way to decouple yourselves from the stressors and the angst of what is bothering you. Not necessarily try to tackle any of those things head on, not try to be a problem solver for that day, but really just be imaginative. What is it that can be done? How could it look? If you can find a way to have everyone on that same vision from the outset, then it kind of brings people out of that kind of defensive thinking. It brings people um, towards this area of creativity and joint imagination. And then that's really, I think, the, uh, the result of why this was such a successful meeting.